Chinese Religion Part 3, Confucius. This presentation gives an introduction to the thought of Confucius. Confucius is the English pronunciation of the Chinese Gong Tse or Gong Fu Tse. The odd spelling has to do with the fact that um, the first people to translate the writings of Gong Tse into a Western language were Jesuit priests, Catholic priests in the 1600s, and they put their text into Latin because that was the standard language of European scholarship at the time. And so Confucius is a Latinized spelling of Gong Fu Tse, and the English pronunciation was even farther from what it would have been in Latin, which would be something like uh, Confucius. So Gong Tse or Confucius was born in the town of Chu Fu in the state of Lu during the early part of the Eastern Shou Dynasty, during the spring and autumn period. He was born into a noble family, but they were not especially wealthy, partly because his father died when he was young, three years old. So he did receive an education because of his noble birth, but he was raised by his mother and he had to start working relatively young as an overseer of granaries and livestock. Because he was literate, he would be able to keep written records of um, the granaries and livestock of an estate. He married at the age of 19. He doesn't really talk much about his wife and his saying, so we don't know that much about her, at least not from him. His mother died a few years after his marriage when he was 23 years of age. And he took this opportunity to perform an extended period of mourning that lasted two years and a day. The reckoning in traditional Chinese way of counting years is three years because it was into the third year that the mourning ends. But this custom was something that had been observed earlier in the Chou Dynasty. And it recognizes the fact that a child is completely dependent on their parents for the first two years of their life. So after the death of a parent, it's only fitting, according to the logic of this custom, to observe a period of mourning that lasts as long as that period of dependence. During the period, he worked less at his job, but devoted himself to studying the ritual and the classic texts of the earlier Chou dynasty. In so doing, he became an educated scholar or Ru, and eventually his main occupation was to teach the ceremonies and ritual of the Chou kings um, and the classic texts of the earlier Chou dynasty to a group of students. The Ru or scholars were experts in the ritual music and classic texts of the early Chou dynasty. These were desired to be in the service of nobles and kings during the Chou because they could perform ceremonies getting the gods or spirits to give good fortune, blessings, or luck for the rulers. And also because they were educated, they could serve as capable advisors and administrators to nobles and kings. So even though the term Ru referred to a class of scholars during the period of the Cho, it serves as the basis for the Chinese names for Confucianism. Ru Jia means the school literally the house or the family of the Ru, but it's a way of referring to the school of thought of Confucius and his followers. Ru Jiao is literally Confucian tradition, but it's a way of referring to the religious aspects of Confucianism. So Confucius thought of learning or shui not as something you should do just for the sake of getting a job. That was something that many people who wanted to improve their lot in life might have tried to do during the Chou dynasty. Because even though most people were born into positions of privilege, the kings, the greater lords, like the dukes, the marquises, there were also people who could be appointed to a position of authority in the service of a king, duke, or other noble lord. These were the Ru. So many people who could afford to wanted to get an education to become a scholar and then to enter the service of a lord and thus become you know, relatively wealthy and powerful compared to what they were before. So education for those who got it during this period was often viewed as a path to greater prosperity, authority, influence. However, Confucius thought this was the wrong view of education. He thought of education as something that should cultivate your character so the purpose of education is to become a virtuous person, a wise and virtuous person. 
It's not just to learn things that can help you serve as a kind of tool or utensil uh, in the service of a Lord. So he opposed uh, thinking of education in a kind of narrow or technical way and thought of it as something that should broadly shape your humanity. So Confucius's view of learning is similar in that respect to the idea of a liberal or free education from the Western tradition. The liberal arts or the liberal education was something that would have been reserved for people of noble or higher birth in the West, um, people who didn't have to train in specific occupation like farmer or blacksmith because they could um, afford to spend leisure time learning about classics. But in the Confucian context, even though this type of education um, would have been mainly open to anyone of higher birth, um, it was used specifically as a mode of advancement by people who wanted to climb the ranks of power and wealth. Um, so for Confucius, he thought of learning as involving especially ritual or Li and studying classic texts or Jing. The inclusion of ritual or ceremony might seem odd, but for Confucius, it wasn't just a way of learning how to perform ceremonies to keep the gods happy. He thought of learning ritual as involving training all of your behavior. So partly this was because the word Li during this period of the Cho assumed a broader meaning as not including only literal ceremonies honoring the gods, but also any type of propriety or proper conduct. If you were an educated uh, person or a respectful person, you would act ceremoniously around everyone, especially those of higher status than you, but ideally around everyone. And this was how Confucius regarded Li. It's a training in how to act properly, not just towards the gods, but also towards people. And another aspect of Confucian learning is studying these classic texts to learn from the example of history. That's one way of thinking about it. Um, you could basically learn good and bad examples by studying history and by studying literature. You could also study songs and gain insights into human emotion and sentiment and insights into self-cultivation. And finally, another aspect of learning was learning about particular people who are very virtuous that you could use as role models or moral exemplars, especially people who are morally perfect called sheng ren or perfected people. So Confucius thinks of learning not just as learning facts or techniques that can help you work in a job or work in the service of someone, but as training your mind or your heart. So the word xin in Chinese uh, can mean heart, literally, but it also metaphorically means your mind or consciousness. So oftentimes to reflect this dual meaning of the word, it is translated as heart-mind or heart-mind in English. Although if you think about the English word heart, it too has a dual meaning. It can refer either literally to the organ or to your mind, especially the deeper and more profound parts of your mind. Confucius compares training the mind to cutting and polishing raw jade so that it becomes a gem. Jade, when it's just um, unearthed, is often rough and doesn't appear very bright, shiny, or beautiful. So you have to polish it uh, for a long period before it gains its luster. So this is Confucius's metaphor for the gradual process of transforming your heart into something from something rough hewn and crude and undeveloped to something beautiful and polished. Um, this is something that Confucius and his followers, this metaphor, they would return to uh, much in later periods. It's related to the Confucian idea of education, the process of transformation, and also it takes effort. It doesn't just happen naturally or spontaneously. You have to deliberately polish your heart just as a gemsmith or jeweler would polish jade into a gem. So um, I've talked about the two meanings of ritual. It can mean literal ceremonies honoring the spirits. It can also mean rules of etiquette or morality that regulate your behavior. So Confucius taught that a person should regulate himself by ritual at all times. And in so doing, you would develop your awareness of your action 
and you would develop discipline. So this is one of the main methods for cultivating virtue. It's not just a matter of luck or chance if you're a good person. You can develop it like a skill or build it like a muscle. Um, now, Confucius does seem to have believed that the gods and spirits were real. At least he never denies them or questions them. However, he did not give a theory of the identity, names, or nature of the spirits. So his view is that you should serve the spirits through ritual, but he was not interested in giving a complete theoretical account of their nature. In fact, when explicitly asked about the spirits, he basically would direct people's attention back to human life. How could you understand the spirits without understanding other people? Um, the picture on the right may seem unrelated to ritual, but in fact, the practice of archery was an important martial art during the Chou Dynasty. So originally this was done by the nobles so they could uh, fight effectively in battle. I mean, they trained with sword and other weapons too, but um, firing uh, bows, especially from chariot or horseback, was one of their fortes. So that's something you would have to practice to get good at. Um, in later years, it became a kind of noble art that you would practice not just to use it in actual battle, but as a way of showing excellence and of training your body and your mind. And so that's something that Confucius would have regarded as part of the practice or training of a well-rounded person. You would study texts, but you could also learn music and martial arts such as archery. And this is a modern demonstration by a Buddhist monk, interestingly, of archery in the traditional Confucian way at a Confucian temple. Um, the connection to Buddhism is just that in later years, archery, because it was a part of the Confucian education, also became taught in other places that studied literature, like Buddhist monasteries. The five classics, or Wu Jing, were the list of classic texts that Confucius believed you should study in order to cultivate yourself morally. The word Wu here means five, and Jing means a book or a classic text. Um, there were many texts from the Cho, but Confucius thought that these were the five most important ones, essentially. Uh, there was also a sixth classic, the Book of Music, but it was lost uh, to later periods. The first one, the Book of Changes, was the divination manual that we discussed previously. The Book of Documents was a collection of historical records and proclamations. You know, it may seem weird to think that if you study these historical proclamations, you could gain some sort of virtue or wisdom. A modern analogy would be people in the United States who view early political documents in the founding of the country, like the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution of the United States or the Bill of Rights as containing some sort of wisdom or political virtue that you could learn from. The Book of Odes is a book of songs, including both popular or folk songs and songs that would be performed at the court of the Cho kings. Even though these don't directly relate to morality or politics, Confucius looked for moral messages into the songs, and he encouraged that manner of interpretation in his followers so you could learn morally from them. This is similar in some ways to the use of um, songs in the book of Psalms in the Hebrew Bible. Most of those do reference God and religious themes directly. However, some of them, um, you know, th they have layers of religious interpretation that were added to them after the fact by later generations. Another example of that is the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon in the Hebrew Bible, which originally was just a wedding song, but became interpreted um, metaphorically as referring to the marriage of the soul with God or the marriage of Christ and the church, things like that. So Confucius, in other words, is looking for deeper moral meanings in these songs. The Book of Rites is a record of the customs and ceremony um, of the Cho. And so this is where you actually learn how to conduct yourself. The Spring and Autumn Annals are annual records. So these are updated every year, specifically during the spring and autumn season, so twice a year that recorded events during this period. 
And traditionally, these are regarded as having been authored or edited together by Confucius. So the role of moral exemplars or role models in Confucianism is worth talking about. Confucius doesn't think of morality as something you could spell out in a list of rules, like the commandments of the Hebrew Bible or the precepts of Buddhism. And if you follow the rules, you're okay. Instead, um, moral virtue requires judgment and discernment. So there are things, of course, that are usually wrong, but you have to use your judgment to apply the general rules to particular situations. The, and there's no shortcut to developing the judgment. What you can do instead is try to understand and emulate um, ideal moral exemplars. These are people who are supremely virtuous or wise. It's actually similar to the modern evangelical Christian idea of modeling yourself on Jesus by asking the question, what would Jesus do? But Confucius instead would have asked a question like, what would the Duke of Cho do in this situation? Um, so for Confucius, the main role models were the former kings, the sage kings, such as the five emperors, um, and also the early kings of the Cho dynasty, kings Wen and Wu and Chang and the Duke of Cho. Um, later Confucians regarded Confucius himself as the main moral role model, though. Confucius, in the earlier part of his career, did not regard himself as a morally perfected person, evidently. And so he would look to someone even higher than himself to give him an example, to give him guidance. And the idea is by following these people, you're actually subtly internalizing their way of thinking, their way of being, and becoming more like them. The idea of a moral role model um, relates to this distinction between a Jun Se and a Sheng Ren. So Jun Se literally means a person of noble birth, the son of a lord. Um, however, Confucius kind of repurposed this term. So it referred not just to a person born to a noble family, but to someone who was noble in their character or manners. So a morally cultivated or educated person. The Jun Se is what you're striving to be as a Confucian. However, a person who's a Jun Se is not necessarily morally perfect. They are morally developed, but they can still make mistakes. So even if you've successfully become a Junsa, it still makes sense to have a moral role model. Well, what is better than a Junsa? That's where the Shang Ren comes in. This is a literally a perfected person. And that would be someone who's almost superhumanly, not quite, but almost superhumanly wise. So someone who is as wise as is possible, as wise and virtuous as possible, such as um, the Yellow Emperor Huangdi, or such as the early Cho Kings. And these were the people that Confucius thought you should use as your moral role models because they will continue to guide you no matter how far you get along the path to moral virtue. The Confucian term for virtue is De. This is used um, also in Taoism and other Chinese traditions. Um, it can also mean power, and originally seems to have referred to a type of power you could accumulate, for example, through performing rituals correctly. So a type of spiritual power that you could get from honoring the spirits. But for Confucius, it mainly refers to moral virtue. And the power aspect is still there because a virtuous person is able to exert influence over others by their good example. So this relates to Confucius's apparent idea that humans are a very social species and we naturally imitate or follow those around us. And especially if you are a virtuous person, there's a kind of inherent moral authority that comes with that and you will influence others. The most important virtue for Confucius is called Ren. So literally this means humanity, humanity or humaneness. So it's the human virtue of having empathy and respect or regard for other humans. And uh, it's kind of similar to the English word humane, which is similar to the word human. And it suggests that the real nature of humans is to become humane. So for Confucius, the real nature of humans is to become Ren, 
that's kind of what we want to strive towards and what perfects us as humans. We're not fully human unless we're fully humane, fully rent. Um, however, this is a kind of gradual process and Confucius often uses the term ren as referring to someone specifically who has perfected their human nature. Um, there are other more specific virtues, including yi, that is often translated as uprightness or righteousness. So it's following rules and being disciplined, even at a personal cost to oneself or one's family. Someone who's upright will do the right thing, even if it's difficult. So uh, whereas Ren might be thought of as a more kind of soft virtue, in a way, a virtue of having care for others, Yi is a more strict or firm virtue of being upright. Xiao is another really important Confucian virtue. It means the reverence that a son has for his father, but it has an expanded meaning in Confucianism. So Confucius thinks that virtue begins with the family, specifically the respect a child has for their parents and ancestors. And so the idea is you, your first relationship is with your parents. And so if you respect them, you're more likely to have a respectful relationship to other people as well. It's a kind of cornerstone virtue for the uh, Confucian tradition. So now we come to Confucius's political philosophy. So like many thinkers or scholars of the spring and autumn period, Confucius was looking around at the kind of disordered society. Um, the Cho kings ruled in name from their capital, but they did not control the whole kingdom. The society was divided both among the duchies and in other ways too. So many people looked at this chaotic political situation and tried to come up with ideas or alternatives for restoring the order of society. Confucius believed that the only way to have a healthy, prosperous, effective society would be to have a virtuous ruler. He thought there were no shortcuts. You can't have you know, a merely competent ruler who appoints good people. You can't have a ruler who themselves has a bad character and just tries to appoint people who will help him rule effectively. The reason why Confucius thinks this is that he thinks that rulers will naturally set the example for their followers. So a ruler who is being greedy or abusive, that's going to trickle down to his chief ministers. Um, even if they're seemingly loyal to the ruler, um, they will tend to follow the ruler's example and try to enrich themselves at the expense of the kingdom or you know try to punish or abuse their enemies and there's this natural trickle down effect the example of the ruler can even trickle down all the way to the common people just normal families and clans so he thought that the ruler must be virtuous and also appoint good ministers and then it will all work because the ruler will give a good example for the chief ministers and then they will give a good example for the officials and others under them and it will go all the way down to the individual households of the kingdom. And uh, basically Confucius seems to know this is a difficult process. Virtue is not something easy. It has to be trained deliberately. So part of his mission was providing a good moral education for a class of scholars who could then go on to provide moral education for the nobles and the king, and then eventually try to restore society that way by having a ruler who is actually virtuous at the top. There's also a concept of Confucius called Cheng Ming, which means rectifying names or setting them right. And Confucius seemed to believe that there is a moral dimension of names or titles so that names of different types of people or social roles like father, son, ruler, servant, these are not morally neutral concepts. They have embedded in them certain moral expectations. And there's something um, dysfunctional about a person occupying a role or position when they don't have the actual authority that position is supposed to have or 
when they don't live up to the duties that come with that position. So a true king should have the authority of a king, should be obeyed by the other people in the kingdom. But also the true king will be one who rules well and effectively and benefits others. It's kind of like saying that someone is not a true doctor unless they heal their patients successfully. Someone might have a degree, an MD, and might treat patients, but you might think they're not really a true doctor, a true physician, unless they're actually effective at healing or at benefiting the health of their patients. So Confucius's idea is that the use of the names of titles is all confused in the society because we have rulers who are not behaving like rulers or rulers in name who don't have the actual authority of a ruler. An example of that is um, the Cho kings themselves. So during part of the period of Confucius's life, the Cho kingdom was in name ruled by King Jing, who ruled from the capital, Changzhou. But he did not really have authority over the whole kingdom. So he was called a king, but he was a king in name only. So the rectification of names principle, you could take that in one of two ways. Either King, Zhou should be king Jing should be restored to his true authority over the entire kingdom, or he should abandon the title king because it doesn't fit. Another example, um, the ruler of Confucius's own state of Lu was a man named Duke Ai. So the, the states were for the most part ruled by dukes. And Duke Ai was someone who was supposed to be ruler of Lu, but in fact, real power had passed to a group of three families called the Three Huang. And they held the actual authority. They were originally families of ministers or servants of the Duke, but they had usurped the actual power from him. And he didn't actually have the ability to command the armies of the state, for example. And so this is a further example of confusion of names, where you have someone who in theory is Duke, but in fact lacks the power. So Confucius wanted to change that by only giving people names when they deserve them, but also conversely on the other side, having other people in society respect people who held certain titles and give them the proper authority and deference. So that's Chung Ming or rectification of names. And Confucius thought if you did this, then you could create social order.